This is Philippians 1, if you want to follow along. It's on page 1,229 in the Bible in front of you. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. To all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's where it gets into the prayer part. I thank my God every time I remember you. And all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. For whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Well, you can open your book, uh, your Bible, to Philippians. Uh, I'm not going to read it again, but if you want to follow along and make sure I'm preaching the word, you can do that, or you can uh, just listen. Uh, it's, I feel led to praise. I'm going to do that. Yeah. Father, this is your word. It's your living word. You say in your spirit, you say in your uh, in scripture that it's the sword of the spirit. The word of the Lord is the sword of the spirit. Today, I pray that you would use the sword of your word to cut to the heart of the matter. You say it divides joint and marrow, bone, and sinew, and I pray that you would do that in our lives, and you cut right to the heart of the matter. Um, let this one just be a great application for somebody else. Uh, they, oh, that's so good. They would listen to that. Oh, that's so good. We pray that it would cut into our own lives and bring um, maybe a wounding, but a healing also so that we could be transformed. We need you in our lives. I need you in our lives, in my life. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. So it is good to be back. Uh, we're starting a new sermon series this morning on the book of Philippians. It's uh, one of the letters in the New Testament written by Paul to one of the churches that he started. Um, the church is Philippi, and therefore it's called uh, Philippians. Um, so this is a picture of the current place of Philippi, and that's the form where people are gathered. But behind that, you see the, on the top of the screen, you see a basilica. That's the basilica that was built sometime after Paul wrote the letter, quite a ways after. Eventually, Philippi became a very uh, religious place in terms of a Christian place, and they built this huge town there that the city really became a Christian town. And, uh, well, he needs his gift. So, I'm sorry. That's all right. Um, so this place, this place became a very Christian place. Um, it started, though, the church there started, it's recorded in the book of Acts, where... Uh, Paul went there, and there wasn't really a synagogue because there wasn't enough men to gather a synagogue together. He required 13 uh, Jewish males, Jew males, to start a synagogue. It wasn't that. But by the river, there was a place of prayer, and he met the women there, and the women there started the church, um, and really because they were devout and God worked with their lives. And eventually, this became a great city center. This is some time after Paul was there initially, and it's, uh, it's the beginning church, and Paul is speaking in their lives. There's a couple of things you should know about this passage right up front, um, really about the book right up front. And that is that Paul is in prison when he writes it. He's in prison, likely in Rome. If you've read the book of Acts lately, or maybe you just remember it, you know that Paul uh, went to Jerusalem and he was told time and time again, you're going to get put in jail, you're going to get put in jail. He's like, I know, I know, I know, but God needs me to go there. So he went to Jerusalem, got put in jail, got transported on a ship that didn't make it all the way to Rome, but eventually got to Rome. He likely wrote this when he was in chains in Rome to the church in Philippi. The other thing that's really helpful to know up front is that the Philippians uh, sent him a gift, sent him a gift for um, his existence in jail. You know, if you go up to the Kent County Jail um, here, like if you get arrested and you 
good uh, ketchup paste or whatever. Um, you really can't kind of feel, they'll feed you, they won't feed you that well. Most of it's made out of soybeans. Um, and I'm not totally kidding about that. But uh, they'll feed you, but you know, it's not the best food. But here in Rome, you really they didn't take care of you that well. It's more like a, a deal like I hear about in Mexico. You get locked up if you want to eat, your family will bring you some food, because otherwise you're not going to eat too well. Um, and it's kind of the case here, they don't take care of you that well. And so the church in Philippi sent the gifts so he could live while he was in change, chains. And he's writing a letter to the Philippians saying, thank you for this gift. Um, and then he addresses some other things later. So that's sort of the context of it. We're preaching through it this summer for a number of reasons. Remember a while back we did a sermon series on the gifts of the Spirit, then the last one was on giving. And this really flows right out of that because uh, he's writing a letter to the people of Philippi who have given him a gift. So it kind of flows out of that um, sermon series. And we're also doing it because Pastor Heather uh, felt led to do the memory scripture memory club on Philippians. We thought this is just a whole lot of collusion in a good way uh, of things that are going together. So some of you are memorizing the book of Philippians. How many are trying to do that? A few. Uh, a few. If you want to do that but don't want to come to church early for that club, uh, if God leads you to do that, you can do that anyway. But otherwise, there's the scripture memory things on a bulletin board down in the hallway. And really, that is the best way to get scripture uh, inside of us to memorize it. That's for later. I'll pick it up later. All right. So uh, the book of Philippians starts with this. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi together with overseers and deacons. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm going to kind of go through this uh, bit by bit just to help us understand the text. Um, so first of all, Paul and Timothy worked together. Timothy was like his uh, son, his mentee, and Paul was a mentor. Most of these books that Paul wrote in the New Testament are written by him or spoken by him, but written by somebody else. It's probably the case. Um, he says to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with overseers, um, Elders, bishops, perhaps, it used to be translated as deacons. So it's to everybody there. Um, and grace and peace to you from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. So what he's saying up front is um, he's saying this is a letter to people who I love and respect. Often in the opening passages in the New Testament books, he launches right into the issue that he cares about. So if you look at the book of Galatians, this whole passage, this Thanksgiving section opens, he says this. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you, right? The Galatians had a serious issue. He just launches right into it. You can kind of tell what Paul's going to write about by these opening sections. And this Thanksgiving section here starts with this. He says, I thank my God every time I remember you. And all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And so you get the sense real quick that Paul has a great relationship with his church in Philippi. There's no huge overarching issue that he wants to uh, sort of address right up front. He basically is super grateful, super thankful for this church who is supporting him, even when he is a long ways away and they don't have to. It's mostly just a, a statement of, we are so grateful. So have you ever had anybody in your life who you're grateful for in this way? And I can start by asking you the question, have you ever been locked up? Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, I was going to say, who's all been locked up? But that gets a little awkward unless you're comfortable. So I grew, up in, uh, I grew up in Iowa, and in the middle of Iowa, not that many people are locked up because there's not that much crime, and the people who do are usually brought home to their parents, and uh, things get resolved that way. Um, but living in the city for some time, I know a lot of people that have been locked up, and it's become more and more of a uh, thing where I realized that this is something that happens all the time. Now, I've never been locked up, but I've been up to jail uh, more than a few times in prison to visit people. And one thing that becomes really apparent really quickly is that when you get locked up, the people that visit, the people that send cards, the people that send you a message through JPay or help pay for things in commissary, um, they are really special people. Because nobody has to help somebody who's in jail. Right? So if you're in jail, you're locked up, and somebody goes to the effort of helping you in a very particular way that they don't have to help you, and it really means a lot. Am I right? Am I right? Anybody who's been in jail? Yes, yeah. Oh, yeah. This is important. This is a really like, wow. And plus, you're not that busy, so you have lots of time to think about it and express your gratitude and be thankful for the one person who sent a note uh, that was your one note this week, or for the commissary, so you can get some things that aren't made out of soybeans. 
Uh, this is how life works. Now, some of us haven't been locked up, so we need to think on who are we grateful for in our lives? And I want to ask you this question. I want you to ask yourself this question. Who are some people who have been helpful in your life that they didn't have to help, but they did help in a very effective way? If you think back, who are some of the people that have been that? Amen. That's probably the best answer we're going to get. My wife. I love her. Father. Father. Somebody else said something. Friends from church. God. What did you say, God? Yeah. Yeah, God. He works his grace through people. Um, I think of one particular time in my life when I was in uh, college, and I had been praying for years. You know, you, you hear these messages about Paul and Timothy and this mentor mentee relationship, and you hear these kind of things like everybody should have a mentor, everybody should have peers, and everybody should. Um, be a mentor to somebody else, sort of this threefold thing of how to do life. But I couldn't find any mentors in high school um, who would mentor me spiritually. And some of you have expressed that that's a thing in your life. You can't find mentors. So for years, four or five years, I was praying for God to send me a mentor, someone who could sort of mentor me spiritually, and uh, nothing happened. Now, it could have had something to do with the fact that my theme song at that time was uh, I am a rock, I am an island, right? Um, I dropped out of high school, I went to, I didn't know that many people, so I wasn't exactly making myself available for people to mentor me, but um, my issues aside, I went to college and eventually went through a whole spiritual transformation thing, and at that point I had a lot of questions, and one person who had time, because he was a transfer prof, sort of a visiting professor, he had time in his life, because it wasn't so filled up with so many other things, he took time to sort of walk me through some spiritual issues, some, uh, some theological questions that I had, and he basically made time for me. And when I, when I think of this guy, Stuart Fowler is his name, um, I thank my God every time I remember him. Because he was uniquely helpful in a way he didn't have to be at that time in my life. So I was on vacation last couple of weeks, and as I thought about this church, um, I had the same thought. I thank my God every time I think of him. Because there's so many churches that, for whatever reason, I need to say this first. There's so many churches that are obedient and faithful and doing what God has called them to do and God is blessing that. So I'm not saying like this is the only one, but there's so many churches that I also see that simply refuse to do the next thing that God is calling them to do. And it's often not that hard. It's just different. So there's so many churches that when they get invited to open the doors to other organizations, they say no because after all we just got new carpet or it's a pain in the neck or they think a little bit differently or they look a little differently. And time after time this church is done just taking step after step um, in the sermon together to say we want to be a church that has our doors open for the people around us. And it's, it's been difficult, it's been awkward, it's been uh, <laughs> sort of uh, weird at some times. There's been a lot of discerning conversations, but you've done that time and time again. You've been obedient, and I, uh, I'm just so grateful for that. I could name particular people um, who I'm very thankful for, but I want to... I didn't ask Dave and Linda if I could do this, but I want to um, just share about Linda being off for a little bit. Um, but I got a couch and saying, I'm so thankful for everybody who does worship up here because um, you don't have to, right? Uh, you're just living lives and you're fitness in your schedule, leading worship, doing great, and that, enjoy. In the midst of a whole lot of other difficulty, that's very real. We don't have to do this, but I thank my God every time I think of you. Um, Linda being off uh, some time ago uh, joined uh, the worship team. And then, a little later, she said, you know, I can step in and do these couple things uh, graciously, and I am able to do that. And the, those couple things at that time were, she was able to uh, gather people together and then ask them when they could serve and how they could serve, and basically just did a great job of calling people. And for Linda, it wasn't a big deal because she's just really good at that. But for me, I totally didn't see it coming. You know, some people, you know, they can do things, and you just do it, and you don't really think about it that much. But for me, I had no idea Linda had this skill set. Um, but over time, she's been used by God in a whole variety of ways, and she's learned all sorts of things. And so she stepped into the worship team and uh, just called people and got things done in a week and a half that I've been just hoping and praying that someone would be able to do. And I could say that for everyone on the worship team, but Linda uh, caught me unawares because it was just amazing. So I think of that, especially as Linda's dealing with uh, this cancer thing now. Every time I think of Linda, I, think, I thank God for her. And so I want you to think about who in your life is that person 
who has been there for you in unique ways, maybe not even in a close relationship, but someone who's able, been able to speak into your life. And to get that person in mind. And just maybe just put it in a category of I thank my God every time I think of them. Maybe God's calling you to send them a note, to send them a letter. Maybe God's calling you to pray for them because everybody has things in their life. Maybe it's just a, a state that says, I need to have an attitude of gratitude for this person who spent a lot of time. And name it for what it is. Because uh, people step out. What is it? I thank my God every time I think of you. And all my prayers for you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. You know, one thing that's not apparent in this passage uh, right away is the difficulty that the Philippians were going through at this time. It's really not that apparent. We've got to know a little bit about the context. Uh, Philippians lived in a, well, obviously, a town was Philippi, but it was a Roman cultural center. Uh, the emperors of the Roman Empire uh, had a did a very strategic thing. I forget the emperor's name, but he did a very strategic thing. After a couple of wars, uh, this happened in two times, he took all the generals who had done amazing things in the war, and he sent them to retire in Philippi, which was a great strategic move because you don't want the really powerful people in the army too close to you, right? Because they might want power. You give them a nice retirement community in Philippi and uh, get them a little bit further away, give them a good life so they don't have to sort of struggle and don't be a threat to you. But they the result was that the town of Philippi became a very Roman town. And in the Roman Empire, the person, the, uh, what happened as far as religion is that you'd worship the emperor, the emperor. And in almost every cultural event, like let's say the 4th of July thing that we had, every festival, you would have to worship in some way with your words the Roman Empire. So we did a tour of Turkey, which is kind of where this is, not exactly. And even in the parades that would come by, you would have to put a little candle out in some way honoring the Roman emperor. Now, if you didn't do this, if you called Jesus Christ your Lord and your Savior, which were also words for the Roman emperor, you would immediately sort of be shunned and pushed out of the cultural context, right? So the people in Philippi at this time who were Christians weren't just sort of uh, under the radar. They would have been in a situation that they were directly calling someone else Lord and Savior when everyone was required to call the Emperor Lord and Savior. So they were in a difficult time. They were also in a difficult time because as you get through this, uh, this book of Philippi, toward the end, there's two women that are disagreeing in a major way. And that's why Paul says, in all my prayers for all of you, I always thank God. He's saying, I thank God for all of you. So there's a couple things that are going on here. In spite of the fact that they're gracious and they've given a gift to Paul, there's also some issues in their lives and in the church at that time. But he says to them, I am thankful for you. I am thankful for you, and I want to encourage you to continue going. So, um, I guess I say that because all of us, uh, some of us in particular, are dealing with really difficult things in life, but it doesn't mean that we can't be people who extend grace to other people. So, how do we do this? I mean, one of the... One of the applications, I probably should have said it right there. Uh, one of the applications uh, in our lives in this passage, when I think of it, is how do I be this person? How do I be the person who people think of, and when they think of me, they think, oh, I thank my God every time I think of that person uh, because of what that person has done in my life. And that's honestly a bit of a challenge, because one of my... Um, roles as a pastor is to be pastoral. And over the years, people have said this, you know, I thank my God every time I think of you. They always pray. But, you know, I'm a pastor of a church that's um, uh, not huge, but has lots of people, and I can't be everything I want to be to everybody. So when I think of this, we all have room to grow, and I have room to grow, and I, I don't want to be the person who's so busy that I don't actually ever have time to talk to people. And one of the things I kind of got convicted of the last couple weeks when I was um, out and about, and lots of times, is, am I available? Am I available to people to talk to? And the same question might apply to each one of us. Are we available to be the kind of people that give gifts to other people when the time comes? 
And there's something in this passage that I think is incredibly helpful in that um, the Philippians gave one gift to Paul, maybe two, and he thanked them for it. So for me, it's not so much about do we always give everything to everybody around us. It's at the right time are we people who give gifts so that other people can be thankful and grateful for us. And we all got to go to work. Most of us got to go to work anyway. We have a thousand and one responsibilities. You know, we got to clean the toilet. We got to mow the yard. We got to do this. We got to do the things, right? But in the middle of those things that we got to do, are we the kind of people that give gifts to other people at the appropriate times so we can be used by God? I was, uh, yesterday I was praying and getting ready to preach today, and also just reflecting on, um, you know, what has God called me to do, and how has God called me to do it, in the midst of all the challenges that exist. And just sort of asking the question, not with a lot of angst and punks, but asking the question. And I'm walking around in a parking lot, and there was a picture, I think I have it here, uh, not a picture, there was this. Uh, I could not get a good picture of it. I couldn't get a good picture of this, but there's, there's a pine tree there. I think it's a scotch pine. And if you can see it, the pine cones on the bottom are all standing upright. Now it's kind of like did somebody came and take these pine cones and put them all upright under this tree. Like, what's going on here? Um, so it caught my attention. Then it caught my attention spiritually. Like, there's something in here. Like, what is it? What is it? Um, so I took this picture. And in this picture, you can see the pine tree is standing tall, and all the little pine cones are trying to imitated. And I thought, this is, this is interesting. Now, I brought these here because, like, how did this happen, right? I'll check this out. It's going to stop in there. I'll try to get it up here. They all go up right. Like, when did God design this? Like, in before the passage of time, he figured this out. This is amazing. It's like the original Weeble Wobble, right? <laughs> they don't all do it. But um, most of them do enough that that is completely not a set up uh, picture. And what it reminded me of is you know, how do we be these kind of people that give grace to the people around us? And it basically is like being little Jesuses. Just be like Jesus, just be faithful. If you want to be the kind of person who God praise flows through you, just be faithful. I'm reminded again of what Reverend Philo Young said uh, a couple months ago now. God blesses those who keep his commandments. It's not that complicated. It might be super difficult, but it's really not that complicated. If you keep God's commandments, work and seek to be like Jesus, stay in community, this is what happens. Now, you can take this analogy further, this may be further than I should do during the sermon, um, this may be more personal, but a couple of things just struck me. Uh, it's a foundation, it's flat on the bottom, it's a foundation, it's a good foundation. Uh, if we keep his commandments, God works through us. Also, um, you know, this plant cone only has a limited amount of seeds that are in it. We're not called to help everybody all the time in every single way, but when God presents an opportunity, then we're invited to step in. It's like it's episodic. We are invited to help people in particular times, in particular places, in particular ways, by the gifts and by the fruit of the Spirit. So for uh, years, I've heard this and now I say it from time to time, there's this passage in here that says, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's sort of God's reading. Paul opened his uh, letters with it quite often. And then we often say the beginning of worship, it's like God's greeting to us. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. But it, it caught new meaning for me this week as I got ready for this. Um, and it caught new meaning for me in this way. Because it's not just for us. When God's grace and peace come to us through the Lord Jesus Christ, we end up being a blessing to the people around us. That's the goal. When we live lives of righteousness, when we live lives of obedience, God works through us in ways that only He can do. So I wanted to tell you some stories of camping. I'll just do that as I close. Um, this is important because the world is uh, the world is awesome and amazing, but also full of really like chaotic and dangerous things. 
So we uh, went up to Lake Superior, and one of the funny things about Lake Superior last week is that it was doing a siche. Uh, siche is some French word for uh, like a bathtub effect. So the water goes like this in Lake Superior. And we were down there, and all of a sudden the water was leaving. And if you know the stories of tsunamis from Southeast Asia, right? You know when the water leaves? What happens? It comes back, right? So the first thing I saw when the water was leaving, I went up to the camp office and said, hey, the water's leaving, is this dangerous? And like, oh, they had no idea what was going on. So I went back down to the water, of course. It turns out it wasn't dangerous, but it's just going out and then in and then out and then in. It went out probably, what, uh, 50, 60 feet and the sandbar was exposed and it came in and didn't come in quite as far. Um, but I was like, what is going on? Elias is like, this is such a weird lake, right? It's such a weird lake. Um, <laughs> But life is like that. Like nature is happening and things happen in our lives all the time. We have no control over anything. What are we supposed to do in this situation? Well, be faithful. Be faithful. Um, the other thing that happened is sometime later we're walking around the water and Elias pulls this little string out of the water, but it's alive. It's a little nematode, I think. And we're looking at this. I would have got a picture, but I didn't get it ready. And it's just this little like wire thing, but it's like a little snake and it's putting its little heady thing all over and like what is this creature? And someone there who knows about fishing says, well, it's a worm, it's a parasite. It gets in uh, fish's flesh, and then when you cut up the fish up, it's, there it is. Like, are you serious? There's parasites floating around in this water here, and we're swimming in it? Um, like, life happens, and nature happens. Uh, we were driving down the road on the, way, uh, on the way up north, and my little oil sensor on the camper decided that it would let the oil through the sensor and all over the engine, and all of a sudden there's smoke, like, ethically everywhere. And uh, we got it fixed by the grace of God. Uh, some of you would be smarter than not taking all the oil, but we got it fixed by the grace of God. And then on the way down, a, a brake line broke and pulled off the road in Gaylor, Michigan, and the bridge went quite right, so we pulled it to LDA. I took it off and uh, put a new one on. It was a Pet Boys. No, what was it? O'Reilly's right across the road. So I got a brake line to put on. And again, you know, life happens. But in the middle of that brake line episode, a guy pulled up right next to me. And he was not a Christian by any stretch of the word. It was apparent by his uh, language. But he offered to help. He offered to help. He took time out of his day and offered to help. And as he talked, and as we talked and compared like a metric, uh, a thread versus a standard thread. I was encouraged because the guy took time out of his day to help. And so, yeah, he wasn't a Christian. But when I think about our role as followers of Jesus Christ, when we are filled with the Spirit, have the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, basically when we obey the commands that God has invited us to obey, and when we're filled with the gifts of the Spirit, which are too many to listen in a nice little phrase like that, but things like giving, Things like uh, mercy, things like hospitality, things like prophetic prayer, or just prayer. Things like allowing God to flow through us in ways, particular ways, for particular people at particular times. Then God works, and Jesus shows up. And that's who we're invited to be. Let's pray. Lord, you are a God. You're a Lord. And you're a King. And this morning, as we think about our lives and you working through us, we ask that you work through us in ways that only you can do. Only you can do. And we're going to sing a song in a moment about how your grace is enough. And so just thinking about that, Lord, we pray that, first of all, when it comes to our sin, to our falling short, to our doing things that we shouldn't do, to, to not doing things that we should do, we receive your grace and ask that you cleanse and renew us and help us to be the people that you called us to be in terms of our righteousness. And secondly, but you've called us all in particular ways to do things. And some of us, um, we're called to go to work and come home and clean the bathroom and do some really uh, drudgery things. But in the middle of that, what we ask that you would also invite us into being your hands and your feet and the people around us, that that would give us joy and fill us with your spirit. Or some of us need someone to come into our lives and help us in some ways that we can't help ourselves. Some of us are looking for a mentor. Some of us are looking for help in ways that only you can do. And I pray that you provide that. You provide that. That Stuart Fowler type person, that mentor type person, that person of grace who can send a letter, perhaps even send money, send help into our lives. But others of us are called to be that person directly to people. 
You've given us resources. You've given us abilities. You've given us a calling. You put things on our heart. And we pray that you would help us to be that person. But as we look at the book of Philippians this summer, I pray that you would uh, teach us far more than just what we do on Sundays. You'd help us to uh, accept the challenge of memorizing it. You'd help us to help accept the challenge of reading it. Just like uh, Dave said earlier, like, wow, that's really good. I want to read that. We ask you to help us to accept the challenge of being your people in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.